God has, has always provided for me in ways that I can't even imagine. And even at times when I, I didn't even think God would provide for me. Um, he hasn't ever stopped providing for me even when I was out there and far away from him. When my nephew passed away, that's when I, I knew I needed him the most. And he was young and it broke, it just broke my heart. I was a little bit, I was angry because they took him, God took him at a young age. But I didn't want that to pull me farther away from God than I already was. I, I wanted to use it as a way to get to know God again. I, I tried to turn my fear and stuff, my anger, that I feel, and I know that that's where God, Jesus, meets me at. When I'm being doubtful, when I'm feeling scared, and when I'm getting angry, um, I know that God's with me through prayer, through my Bible readings, through my accountability family, my church family, and, and learning that God will get us through it. It's, it's temporary. Uh, things always work out for the glory of God. and It's His will at the end of the day that's being done. And, and just to be happy and knowing that I'm being used for God's advancement in His kingdom. his testimony because he acknowledges what we all learn if we walk with Jesus for any length of time in this life, and that is that, that we encounter God in those times of loss and pain and struggle. Even though it's difficult, there's a way that God shows up and, and reveals himself to us in those times. And this summer, we're walking through a series called Mixtape, and we're really, what we're really walking through is this big chunk of the Bible in the very, almost the very middle of your Bibles called the Book of Psalms. And the Book of Psalms is a collection of of 150 songs inspired by the Holy Spirit through, through David and other people and recorded for us. And I was thinking back uh, to, to as I was growing up, uh, the idea of a mixtape was a very real one for me. You would take a cassette tape. Some of you don't know what that is, but that, you know, there's lots of them up here on the screen. And it's, it's a cassette tape. You take one of these tapes. It's actual tape in there. It's not digital. And you'd put it in a tape player, and you'd record from tape to tape or from record player. Ask your grandparents what that is. Uh, from a record player or from a tape to tape. And a collection of songs that would, you could give to someone else. And in a sense, that, that collection of songs, that mixtape of psalms was saying, these are, these are songs that I love that mean something to me. And if you listen to these songs, you'll know me better. Or it might be a mixtape of, you'll, I think you'll really love these songs, enjoy these. And it can be given from a friend to a friend, uh, from a parent to a child, from a child to a parent. And now it's a little different world. You basically open something on YouTube. You, you go to the, you know, the, the bar there. You double click. You select. You cop, You paste in. And all they do is click on that. And everybody can listen to music. It's a different world. But it used to be this was the old-fashioned way of sharing your music with other people. And even more old-fashioned than that was God's way. And that is writing it in a book. <laughs> and God gives us 150 songs in his mixtape, the book of Psalms. We don't have any of the music for any of the 150 songs that God gave, but we have the lyrics. And I believe that the lyrics in the book of Psalms will carry you through any journey of life you'll face. At your highest moments of joy and excitement, there are Psalms that declare praise and joy and celebration. At your deepest valleys of pain and loss and struggle, there are Psalms Songs in God's mixtape mix collection that'll, that'll carry you through the deepest, darkest times of pain and struggle and loss and everything in between. And, and there's one psalm in particular. We're going to look at that entire psalm today in our message. It's Psalm 40. Psalm 40 is so powerful and so relevant for today that you would think that some band or group would have taken this psalm, psalm, uh, psalm 40, and turned it into a song. You think if some band would have said, this would really be a good song, like maybe like you two would just take the words of Psalm 40 and just turn them into a song. Oh, wait a minute, they did. Did you know that? You know what they called the song that they took from Psalm 40? 40. Very creative. If you listen to you two's song, 40, the entire song, all the words, I waited patiently in the Lord. 
He inclined to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the miry pit. I will sing, sing a new song. You two just took those words from Psalm 40 and put them to music. And what I want to do today is to look at those words and, and put them in our hearts. Because I will guarantee you that the theme of this psalm is going to be a theme of your life at some point. Because Psalm 40 is all about the reality that there are times that are hard and painful and difficult. And we need to let God put his arms around us. We need to stand by him. And even in the hardest of times, we can sing a song of praise to God. Now, here's what I've discovered as a pastor through the years. There are people who, who know Jesus, who believe in Jesus, who walk with Jesus, that when they hit a really hard time, not a little hard time, but a really hard time, they'll do this. Okay, fine. God, if you let that happen to me, and you let me go through this for all this time, and I keep asking you to help me and nothing's happening, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk away. I'm going to just take a break from church, from the Bible, from you, God, and people kind of walk away in those hard times. I've seen it happen a lot of times. As a, oh, God, if you would let that happen to someone I love, and they would have to go through that, then, God, I, am, I, just, I just don't, I just can't be close to you. And people will actually sort of walk away from God in those moments. And can I tell you something? Satan, the enemy of your soul, loves that. Satan loves in the hardest times where Christians walk away from God and don't hold on to Jesus and walk away from fellowship with God's people. Because the very time where we need God's presence the most, we kind of distance ourselves. And that's not what God wants. And, and this Psalm of David here in Psalm 40 gives us a different vision of how to live and how to walk through that. And I'm, I'm going to ask my, actually Sherry, I'm going to ask you, can you give me two of those fishermen's friends and bring them up? I should have had them in my pocket. I got a little tickle in my throat. It's not hitting me yet, but I'm not, pro, uh, not prophetic, but predictive. I'm going to start coughing in a minute here. So I'm going to... I'm, this is not my wife, Sherry. This is Sean Stroud. Thank you. <laughs> All right. I'm going to be fine. So Psalm 40. I invite you to open your Bibles to Psalm 40, and I would encourage you to put your Bible on your lap because the first thing we see in Psalm 40 is this. We see David looking back, and when he looks back, we can see God's amazing faithfulness. If you look in your bulletin, there's a place to write some notes down. And this will be the first place to write some notes down. Before we look at the passage there, just, if we'll go back to that last slide, and it just says, uh, it says there that looking back, we can see God's amazing faithfulness. And in Psalm 40, as it begins in the first three verses, we see David declaring the amazing faithfulness of his God. And here's what he says. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and the mire. And he set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. David starts this psalm by, by pausing in his life and pausing and looking back, back at his life. And he's saying, you know, there, there was a time where I was struggling, where I was hurting, where I was in a pit. I was in the mud and the mire. And God came along. I waited patiently, and God lifted me up and stabilized me. I felt like I was going to die. I felt like I was going to lose it. And yet God carried me through, and now I stand strong. And so he's looking back, and he's remembering what's happened in the past. There is something really good for anyone who's a follower of Jesus. And some of you here are followers of Jesus. Some of you are like you're investigating the Christian faith. But when you know Jesus and you follow him, you have moments in life that are hard and difficult and painful. He doesn't promise he's going to take all that away. But he's always with you in the midst of it. And then there's times where you cry out to him and you wait patiently and over time he shows up and he saves you. He delivers you. He takes care of you. And David's saying, I looked back and I remembered those moments. And we have to do that. We have to remember. Look at the, look at the tense of the words. It's all past tense. David's looking back. I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me. He heard my cry. He lifted me out. This, is, this happened in the past. But he's remembering how God delivered him. And we have to do that. If you've been a Christian for any length of time, you have experiences where God showed up. You know what I'm talking about? And God took care of you, and God provided, and God protected, and God did something amazing. And it's just great every so often to stop and look back and say, I remember what God did. Also notice that David is saying, I was in a really bad situation. He says, he lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud, and out of the mire. 
Uh, the, the, in Hebrew poetry uh, and, and, and the wisdom literature, Psalms, Proverbs, Song of Songs, Ecclesiastes, all have kind of a poetic structure to them. And in that kind of structure, it, there would often be what's called synonymous parallelism. It's a good word. Synonymous parallelism. It means the same word, the same concept used again and again and again. And when it's used twice, it's emphasizing the point. If, it's used, if the concept's used three times, that's in the, in the Hebrew mind, that's the most you can emphasize something. So when, when he says, he lifted me up out of the slimy pit, out of the mud, out of the mire, he's saying, my situation was bad, it was bad, it was bad. It's, it's as bad as it could be. And David said, I'm in the, in the, I was in the worst of situations, but in the midst of all that, I didn't bail and run away from God. I waited patiently for the Lord. I waited. I held on to him. And he heard me. And he delivered me. So he's saying this was, this was a seriously difficult time. This was, a, this was a painful time. But what he's saying now is, I waited, and, and through all of this, the clouds parted, and the sun started shining again. Have anybody noticed that sometimes in Monterey, Pacific Grove, Carmel, this area, it can be a little bit foggy and cloudy and a little bit dreary? Anybody, anybody notice that just by showing it? Yeah, okay, occasionally, right? And then you get a day like today, where it just, it just clears out, and you go, oh, and, and there, there was a song written by a guy named Johnny Nash. Not Johnny Cash, but Johnny Nash. Anybody remember Johnny Nash? He, he wrote a song called, I Can See Clearly Now. If you try, you can almost hear it in the back of your mind. <laughs> and what he's saying in this song is he's saying, man, I was in a time of dark clouds, a time of struggle, a time of pain. But man, right now, whew, this is one of those good moments where the clouds have cleared. Things are going. Don't you love those moments of life? So it's going to be a bright, 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 sunshiny day. He's just going to look all around, nothing but clear. It's good right now. <laughs> I'm loving that. And, and, and David is saying, love those moments. Live into those moments. Enjoy those moments. And, 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 and in the tougher times, remember that God delivers. It's not going to always be like that, but boy, in those good times, rejoice and celebrate. But David is saying with absolute clarity that he waited and held on to God through really hard times. And can I tell you, you will face times like this. And, and, and the, the construction, so we've got a lot of people that are into language in our church because we've got the Defense Language Institute nearby. So we have students of language here. We have professors of language here. So for those who love language, let me give you a little language background from the Hebrew language. This, I waited patiently for the Lord, is what, it's what's called the infinitive absolute before the infinitive verb. And you're all like, well, of course it is. You can see it right there in the text. Um, it's the infinitive absolute before the infinitive verb. And the concept there is this. It's the sense of intensive, long-term, enduring attitude while you're waiting. Intensive, long-term, hanging in there, enduring through a hard time. That's what David's talking about. And there's lots of waiting in life. And there's different levels of waiting. You know, there's the, I, I, you, know, you're, you call an airline to book a flight, and you get a recording that says, uh, our, our, all of our operators are busy at this time. We'll have, someone will be with you as soon as possible. You know, and then you wait there, and sometimes you've got to wait like three minutes or five minutes. You're like, oh, it's been five minutes. How do I live in life when they can't meet my need? And, four, you know, and, you're sitting there and, you're just, and five minutes seems like forever. But, but this, this, I waited patiently for the Lord, it's not that kind of waiting. It's not the four or five minutes of inconvenience. It's not the, I had a reservation at the restaurant, and I showed up five minutes early, and they said, oh, uh, we'll have a table for you in about 15 or 20 minutes, which means what? 30 minutes, right? Exactly. And so, you know, but, but it's not that 25 or 30 minutes you're waiting for your table. Oh, what an inconvenience. It's, that's, that, that doesn't get to this sense of I waited patiently for the Lord. It's bigger than, oh, I ordered something I wanted on Amazon Prime, and it'll be here in 24 hours. I've got to wait 24 hours for things to be delivered to my door. You know, it's, it's, it's bigger than that. This sense of the, the infinitive absolute before the infinitive verb is this intensive, long-term enduring. It's the military couple who one of the spouses is going to be deployed. And they say, okay, you're going to be going to wherever we send you for four to six months or whatever. And, 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 and the spouse is waiting. And they say, well, we don't know exactly when they'll be back. And in some cases, we can't tell you exactly where they're going to be. And so day by day goes by, and week by week goes by, and month by month goes by, and you hold 
to Jesus. And you say, God, help me be both father and mother. Help me care for our kids. Help me stand strong. And in the lonely times, you say, God, I waited patiently for the Lord. And weeks go by and months go by. And there's the reality that I know they're serving our country and I know what they're doing is, is a great thing to do. But, but God, this is hard. Help me. That's getting, that's getting to the sense of this, I waited patiently. It was the two years that my wife, who I love, lived with chronic pain. And almost nobody knows that she went through this. This is while we were here at Shoreline. Because every day she would wake up in the morning and sometimes literally crawl out of bed and spend 25 to 30 minutes stretching so she could stand up and walk and live with pain all day long and go to bed with pain. And the doctor is saying, uh, the insurance won't cover this, the insurance won't cover that, uh, we can't do anything about this, and, and just trying different doctors, trying different things, and nothing relieving the pain. And so for almost two years, every single day, watching my wife go through chronic pain and just hold to Jesus and wait for a solution and trust in God. That's the sense of I waited patiently for the Lord. It's, it's, it's the godly Christian man or woman who's married and in love with their spouse, but their spouse doesn't know Jesus. And they've been praying for their spouse for five years, ten years, two decades, three decades. And their spouse is showing no softening of their heart towards Jesus. But they wait, and they cry out to God, and they love their spouse, and they love Jesus, and they hold on to God. That's the sense of I waited patiently for the Lord. It's the young man or young woman who wants to honor God with their life. So they're not running around from person to person and bed to bed. But, but this young woman is keeping herself pure and is not hitting the bar scene and the sleep around scene to try to find the right guy, which is probably not going to be found in that environment anyways. But she's holding to Jesus and months go by and now years are going by and she loves God and she's praying, oh Lord, I'd love to have someone to share life with. I'd love to have a husband who loves you and loves me and there's just nothing on the horizon and she says, I'm just going to hold to you, Jesus, and worship you even though I'm in a time of deep pain and hurting. That's the sense of I waited patiently for the Lord. And a thousand other things that many of you are in the middle of right now. Where you love Jesus, and you're praying, and you're calling out to him. But you don't see the end of the journey, of the pain, of the loneliness, of the struggle, of whatever it is. And, and I want you to hear the heart of God. Th this God who says, hold on to me. Because I am a God who delivers, but sometimes you wait patiently and sometimes it takes a long time of waiting. King David, who the Holy Spirit inspired to write this psalm, King David knew something about waiting. As a young man, he was anointed to become the king of Israel. Samuel who was the kind of like the Billy Graham of his day, Samuel, who was like this great prophet of the land, had anointed David and said, David, you will be king. And put the oil on him, you'll become king of all Israel. You know how long it was till he started to take his role on the throne? 15 years. And in that 15 years, the present king, Saul, was trying to kill him and chasing him all around the countryside, trying to kill him. On two different occasions, David could have actually taken Saul out and become king. And he said, I will not do it. God's going to put me on the throne, not by my own hand. David, you're anointed. You're going to be king. And then he waited patiently for 15 years. And you know what happened 15 years later? He became king over Judah, part of Israel, but not all of Israel. It was seven more years till he became king over all the tribes of Israel. 22 years. God says, I anoint you. You're going to be king. And 22 years later, it becomes a reality. I waited patiently for the Lord. I held on to my God, even though it was a long, hard journey. And some of you are right in the middle of that right now. Some of you have come on the other side of it. But if you've been a Christian for any length at all, you've had some experiences where you can look back and say, there was an area of my life where I waited, I held to Jesus, I loved him, I followed him, I kept singing praises even though I was singing through chapped lips and a parched heart and it was hard, I kept praising God. And God delivered me. Remember those moments. Hold to those moments. And then David kind of turns and he looks to the future, looking forward. And he says, live with trust in God. The same God who delivered you in the past is the God who will deliver you in the future. So looking forward, live with trust in God. Look at Psalm 40, verses 4 and 5. He said, blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, 
who does not look to the proud and to those who turn aside to false gods. But watch the sense of praise. Many, Lord, my God, are the wonders you have done, the things you planned for us. None can compare with you. Were I to speak and tell of your deeds, they would be too many to declare. David says, I can look back and remember how you delivered me, so I can now look ahead and say, I put my trust in God. But you know what David is getting at here? He's saying that even though God's delivered you in the past, and you can remember that, when the new challenge comes, when the new pain comes, when the new loneliness comes, when the new financial struggle comes, when the new downsizing at work comes, when the new deployment comes, and something new happens, and you're right in the midst of it again, he says, remember God's goodness in the past and trust God for the future. And then he warns, listen, he warns, and don't, in those desperate moments of your pain and your loneliness and your struggle and that hard road of waiting, don't put your trust in proud people and in idols. Keep your trust in God. And can I tell you something? We are so tempted, so tempted in the midst of the pain and the loneliness and the hurt of life to, to, turn, to turn to idols or to proud people and say, well, they'll meet my needs. They'll make me happy. They'll satisfy me. And whatever it, it is, it never does. And, there's, and all, all an idol is, all an idol is, is anything we put in our life to say that will satisfy me and make me whole, and it's not God. And we are so tempted to do that. And those voices, the voice of the enemy whispers to us in those moments when you're going through struggle and pain and you're waiting patiently, you're holding to God, but it's been weeks or months or years or decades and you're getting discouraged. And the enemy speaks through a little voice. You know, pick up the bottle and drink it. And all your pain will go away. And you'll feel better. Just drink till you can't even think. And you, and you know what? It's true. The pain does go away. For a couple hours. For a, an evening. Till the next morning. But the next morning when you sober back up again, the pain's still there in your soul. And nothing's better. It's, it's, it's the person who, who, who finds that, that pain-killing drug that takes away the pain, the physical pain or the emotional pain or the psychological pain, and they become addicted to that, to that whatever that is that now becomes their idol, their God. When I'm in trouble, when I'm hurting, I'll just take a couple of these and I'll be better. In the area I lived in Michigan for years, there was a pastor that was kind of our, our group of pastors. And this pastor, gifted pastor, talented pastor, and you would have never known. You would have never known that he was dying on the inside. And there was such brokenness and fear and pain in him that he had, he had become addicted to painkillers just to keep himself kind of afloat as a pastor. Dealing with so many other people's pain and his own pain became too much, so he tar- started taking pills. And his doctors caught on to the fact that he was taking too many and they backed off giving it to him, but he was still desperate to kill his own pain. He started visiting people in his congregation who had chronic pain, asking if he could use their bathroom, going through their cabinet, and it's just taking a few pills here and a few pills there from different people in his car. This is a pastor. He's so much pain, so much brokenness, didn't know where to turn. Here's a pastor who should know to turn to God, but even he didn't. And finally, the church, his church board, people, some of the people reported, we think our pastor's taking our painkillers. And they actually put a certain amount in this person, one person's cabinet, knew he was coming to visit, counted them. After the pastor left, counted them again, called him in, and it was all true. You say, how does that happen? It happens because pastors are people like anybody else. It, ha- it happens when we think that this will solve my pain issue instead of letting God be the one who carries me through and who heals me. And we have to be so careful. And, and, and it can come in all kinds of different shapes and forms. It can come in the TV saying sit and watch. It can come in video games saying spend all your time with me. It can come in, 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 in sexual encounters that we think will satisfy us. It can come in going to, to the, what, what, I, what I call the, the trinity of temptation in my life. The refrigerator, the freezer, and the cabinet. Um, and just, okay, I'll make you feel better. I'll heal you. You'll, you'll, I'll comfort your soul. And you know what? Ice cream will do that. You know, like a big bowl of chocolate ice cream will do that for like for 15 or 20 minutes, right? But afterwards, it goes away. It wears off. And David is saying, look back and remember how God delivered you. Look ahead and trust him and trust him enough to hold to God and don't turn to idols and proud people who say, I will satisfy you. But they can't. They cannot give you what your soul needs. Only God can. And, and, and so, so the question, the, the question becomes, 
Uh, when, hard, when times are hard, where do you tend to, t- tend to run and how do you cope? What is it that you run to? In my family growing up, it was the refrigerator. It was the cabinet. It was food. That's what I grew up with in my family. That was the comforting thing. That was the idol that would make me feel better. What is it for you? And it's important to identify that. And say, man, when I'm, when I'm hurting, when I'm struggling, when I'm in pain, and, and I'm trying to trust God, but there's other things, I could, but I put my trust in this. What is it? Say, God, I don't want to put my trust in that anymore. I want to cry out to you. I want to hold on to you. I want to learn from David's journey of faith. And then David says, so, so there's a best way, a right way to live. And note takers, here's a simple statement. The best way to live is God's will, God's way. God's will, God's way. That's what David begins to pray about next. Look at verse 6 of Psalm 40. He says, sacrifice and offerings you did not desire, but my ears you have opened. Burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not require. What he's saying is, don't do a bunch of wrong stuff and then cover it up with sacrifices later. But live the right way. Look what he says in verse 7. Then I said, here I am, I have come. It is written about me in the scroll. I desire to do your will, my God. Your law is within my heart. He says, I want to do your will. I want to follow your ways. That's why we call people at Shoreline and challenge you, and we provide a reading guide every day of the year to be in this book and to read the Bible. Because God's will and God's truth is found here. Maybe not for every minute detail of life, but for the big picture of all of life, it's in here. And we challenge you to dig into this word and learn. And then David says, not only will my life be yielded to you, but my lips will praise you. He says, I will proclaim your saving acts in the great assembly. I do not seal my lips, Lord, as you know. I do not hide your righteousness in my heart. I speak of your faithfulness and your saving help. I talk about what you've done, God. I do not conceal your love and your faithfulness from the great assembly. David says, I will, I will declare it. I will say it. I will proclaim you, God. And I'm going to live for you. I'm going to live God's will in my life, God's way. Let me ask you a question. And, and I think, it's here, what is one area of your life that you really desire to submit to God's will And what's your next step? What's an area of your life where you're saying, I know this area of my life, it needs to be yielded more to God. I know it. I know it from his word. I know it from sermons I've heard. I know it from the Holy Spirit speaking to my heart. I'm just not doing it. David says, keep walking in a way that say, I'm going to do God's will, God's way. For some of you, it's like, I know I I I need to open this book and read it. I I own a Bible. I own 10 Bibles. I just don't read it. I need to get into that. And maybe your next step is to say, I'm going to use the church reading guide on the website or on my bulletin, and I'm going to start reading the Bible every day. For some of you, it might be very different. You say, well, the thing for me is I need to have more honesty in my business practice. I I keep cutting corners and doing things I know I shouldn't, and if I got caught, I'd be in big trouble, and the Holy Spirit's been convicting me, but I just kind of keep walking down that road. Maybe say, God, I need to live in your will, in your way. For others of you, it might be saying, you know, I, I'm a parent, but I'm so busy, I just tend to run by my kids. Whether I'm running by my kids this tall or running by my kids this tall. And you feel the Holy Spirit saying, I need to slow down and engage in the lives of my kids. I mean, God's given me this great gift. I don't want to miss this moment of life. I don't know what it is that God would speak to you and say, boy, there's an area of your life where you need to live in my will, in my way, more fully. But I know this. If you ask God, he will show you. Every time. How can I say that? Because every time I ask God, he shows me areas of my life that I need to align with as well. He said, well, Kevin, you're a pastor. You don't struggle with this kind of stuff. Yes, I do. I'm, a, I'm not just a pastor. I'm a person. I love Jesus with all my heart. But there's never, been a time, there's never been a time where I've quieted myself and said, Lord, will you show me right now an area of my life that needs to come more in line with your will and your way? There's never been a time where God said, not a problem, you're perfect. I've never got that word, that vibe, that thing from God. Never, once. God's gentle. And you know what God usually says to me? When I say, when I quiet myself and say, Lord, will you show me? He usually says this, you know what it is. (laughs) Because he's been convicting me of it for weeks or months. Bring your life in line. David says, that's the way you live a life that honors God. You remember what he's done in the past. You trust him for the future. And today you live in his will and you live in his way. And then David goes on, and he says, yeah, but there's a hard truth he's facing. Facing the hard truth, the battle is not yet over. As he continues to to pray, and inspired by the Holy Spirit, he acknowledges the fact that he's in a tough time again. Psalm 40, verse 12 says this, for troubles without number surround me. You ever feel like that? Troubles, I can't even number the amount of troubles that are all around me. My sins have overtaken me. I cannot see. I got so much sin I'm struggling with, I can't even see where I'm going anymore. They are more than the hairs of my head, and my heart fails 
within me. David just says, I'm, I, I, mean, I waited patiently for the Lord and he delivered me back then, but right now I'm in it again. I'm in the battle again. I'm in the struggle again. I'm feeling the battle with sin, my own sin, the sins of other people, the brokenness of this world. But man, I feel like I'm stuck in the middle of it again. And some of you feel like, man, that's where I am. I can look back and see God's faithfulness. But right now, man, life is hard. And I feel more lonely than I can put into words. I feel more broken than I can explain to people. I was talking with a, a pastor friend. I asked him how he was doing. And he used a really interesting line. There's a line, he said, he said there's a line in uh, The Hobbit, the movie The Hobbit, or the book The Hobbit, where the main, one of the main characters says, I feel, like, I feel like butter thinly spread across toast. <laughs> he said, I just feel thinly spread. I feel like I'm just, my whole, I just feel like I can't go deep in anything. And he just really was honest. And I thought, that, you know, that's where a lot of people are. And, and, and David is saying, there's times like that. You know, where are you feeling the battle mount against you? How will you fight back? Where's the battle? Where are you struggling? Where is it difficult? And how will I fight back to live for Jesus? And that's what we do. When we wait patiently on the Lord, we keep living for him. We keep singing praise to him, even if we're singing through a heart that's broken. We hold on to God, because the only other option is to walk away from God. And don't do that in your time of pain and struggle. It's when you most need his grace. It's when you most need his people. It's when you most need the church and fellowship. It's when you most need to be at your growth group. It's when you most need to open the Bible. Draw near to God in those times because you need him. And the enemy will whisper, turn and walk away. Don't do it. It never gets better when you walk further from God. And, and then David gives us an example where he just basically says, save me. Help, God, I need you. There's this cry for help. Save me. Help, I need you. Where David acknowledges there's a point where you just say, God, help, I'm in over my head. I can't deal with this on my own. And sometimes in those moments, we're trying to make it, kind of hold it all together, and we need to cry out to God. Look at what he says in chapter 40, verses 13 to 15 of Psalms. Be pleased to save me, Lord. Come quickly, Lord, to help me. He's crying out. And this is interesting. May all who want to take my life be put to shame and confusion. May all who desire to ruin be turned back in disgrace. May those who say to me, aha, aha, be appalled at their own shame. He says, God, help me, deliver me. And those people that are beating up on me and the enemy who's coming against me, God, deal with them. Help, that's a good prayer. God, help, God, save, God, deliver. I need you. And sometimes in those moments when you, when you cry out that prayer, your spouse who's away on deployment and they may be gone for a couple more months, they don't just sort of show up, oh, they're back. But God comes in power and God comes with his presence and God comes and delivers in a different way. You may be, you may be somebody who's waiting for that right person. You're living a godly life and you're longing for a spouse and it's been weeks or months or years and you don't want to compromise. And you say, God, help deliver me. And it's not like the next day, poof, that person's there. Maybe, but maybe not. But God draws near in those moments. And he says, I am your stronghold, and I am your tower, and I am your refuge, and I am your savior. And can I tell you, and a lot of times in life, that has to be enough. You know why? Because it is enough. It's all that's enough is the presence of God and the power of God. It's always enough to sustain you until the rest of that prayer is answered. God says, I will be the answer to that prayer as you wait. So how will you cry out to God for help today? How will you say, God, help me, deliver me? Some of you don't yet know Jesus, and you're saying, I don't even know if I can ask God for help. Try it. I tell people that aren't yet Christians, start to call out to God and ask God to show himself and to show up, and you'll be amazed. You see, what God would work in my life even before I believe in Jesus, oh, he loves you already. He wants you to know he's real. Cry out to him and cry out to him again. And then David finishes by saying, keep rejoicing, keep praising, keep trusting even while you wait. While you're waiting, I waited patiently for the Lord. For David in one of his waiting times, it was 22 years. But while you're waiting, you still rejoice, you still praise, you still trust, you still sing. Look at what David says in verse 16 and 17. But may all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. 
May those who long for your saving help always say, the Lord is great. I can still rejoice. I can still hold him. I can still declare his goodness. But as for me, David says, I am poor and needy. It's still a tough time. May the Lord think of me. You are my help and you are my deliverer. You are my God. Do not delay. Oh God, don't delay. Show up in power. Deliver me. Show me your face. You know, David begins and he says, man, I'm looking back. And I remember times where I waited patiently for the Lord. He heard my cry. He delivered me from the pit, from the muck, from the mire. And he put my feet on a solid rock. So I can trust him to do that in my future. But right now, when you're in the middle of it, and so many people here are today. Some people in our family worship venue online today are saying, I'm, I'm not like just on the backside. I, I, there has been moments where God's delivered me, but I'm in the middle of it. I mean, the, the loneliness, the pain, the struggle, the fear, the, the financial insecurity, the relational turmoil, whatever it is. He said, I'm right in the middle of it. In those moments, don't turn and run from God. Run to Him. Don't stop singing songs of praise. Sing more than you ever have before. Don't stop trusting, but cast yourself on God and say, oh God, I have no one else I can trust for whatever it is I'm going through. Lord Jesus, we come together right now and we pray for all those in this room all those online, all those in our family worship venue who, who know you, who love you, who are hurting right now, who are in the middle of the loneliness or the pain or the deployment or the chronic struggle physically or the financial insecurity or the relational longing, whatever it is that we are facing today. Lord, wrap your arms around us. Remind us of your presence. Speak to us, O oh Lord of your grace and your love and your power. Remind us of your faithfulness to deliver in the past. Assure us of our hope for the future and hold us close right here. Let us sing songs of praise, even if we're singing with a broken heart.